Welcome to Reaching Voices, the podcast series of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation's Multinational Development Policy Dialogue in Brussels. With the series Bridging Voices, we connect international experts and voices from the global south with decision makers in Europe. My name is Janne Leino, and I am a program manager on foreign and security policy here in Brussels. In today's episode, we're going to talk about the EU's engagement in the Sahel. In April, the European Council decided to suspend the ongoing EU training mission in Mali due to the fact that the transition authorities in Mali could not guarantee that the EU trained troops would not cooperate with Russian mercenaries. Next to stopping military training, the EU has also suspended the delivery of military equipment under the newly found European Peace Facility. To discuss the future of European engagement in the Sahel region, I'm delighted to welcome two distinguished guests to today's session. Firstly, let me greet Delina Gojo, who is an associate fellow at the Belgian Royal Institute for International Relations and is currently finishing her doctorate for the Italian Scuola Normale Superiore in Italy. Welcome, Delina. Hi, Janne. As a second speaker, I'm happy to greet one of our own, Mr. Ulf Lessing, uh, who is joining us from the CAS office in Bamako, Mali. Ulf is heading the CAS regional program in the Sahel region, which has activities in Burkina Faso, Mali, Mauritania, Niger, and Chad. Welcome, Ulf. Hi, hey, Janne. How are you doing? Good. Ulf, let's kick it off uh, with you. So as I mentioned, the EU has decided to suspend its training mission in Mali, partly because of suspected links between Russian mercenaries and the local authorities. Question, is Russia on its way to replacing Europe uh, as a security provider in Mali? In a way, yes. The Russians have been heavily expanding in Mali, uh, you know, executed a military cooperation, sending helicopters, probably arms, you know, trainers, allegedly also mercenaries, while, while Euros has been, you know, pulling back. France has, uh, you know, is removing its, its troop. They didn't accept uh, the, the Mali signing an agreement with, uh, implementing an agreement with with Russia. And uh, yeah, so it's, uh, the Russians managed to divide the, the, the Europeans. Uh, we've struggled a bit to come up with a response. Uh, I mean, Germany and other European nations continuing their, you know, contribution to a UN peacekeeping mission mission, mission in, in northern Mali it was established after the French uh, expelled uh, jihadists from the north. But uh, as you said, they decided to, to, to suspend their training activities. Uh, there has been a mission in place since 2013 to yeah, train Malian security forces. It's never been really you know, successful, several reasons. The, the Malians probably weren't really ready. You know, there are structural issues with the Malian army and they had different expectations. They wanted something to, you know, to, to, to go with their soldiers to the front and basically fight with them not just, you know, train in a, in, a, in a location far away from the front line. This, the, the Europeans weren't willing to do that. And the Russians, obviously, they're more, more ruthless. They, they're sending fighters here and they, they actively go to the front and they, they, they train with real guns. So in a way, the, the Russians are providing something which the, uh, which the Europeans weren't willing to do. Uh, but Mali is one of the poorest countries on the earth. What's the Russian reasoning? Why are they active there? What's what's the gain? I think the initial intention was to divide the West. The French military intervention here has been unpopular for a while. There's a lingering anti-French sentiment, mostly for historical reasons. So the the, the French, the, the, you know, the the Russians seized the chance. And now with the invasion of Ukrainian Mali has also become uh, interesting for economic reasons. There's a lot of gold. There's lithium. You know, it's a, it's a metal used for 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 batteries, which is uh, difficult to find around the world. So this has taken a new dimension for the Russians as well. You know, with the Western sanctions imposed on on, on Russia because of the ongoing invasion of of, of Ukraine. Mali has now also, uh, you know, you know, an economic dimension, uh, economic importance for them. You know, if, if they manage to exploit, you know, gold here, that might help them stabilize their own, you know, economy and currency battered by the sanctions. Uh, Delina, uh, you're based in uh, neighboring Niger. So the European Union is pulling out of Mali, but simultaneously emphasizing that that doesn't mean a pull out from the Sahel region. What does it then mean? 
There is one thing that I think we should mention with regard to what is happening in Niger and how Niger is reacting to this pullout from Mali. So there has been so far a certain level of transparency on the part of the Nigerian government. So in February, for example, the president Mohamed Bazoum uh, spoke at the Conférence de Cadre, which is uh, an internal meeting uh, of his own staff. And he said that something that Niger needs is more European help. It needs support from its partners. At the same time, there was a recent interview at La Croix, which is a newspaper, where Bazoum says that it would be an insult for his own army to imagine that only foreign forces can stem insecurity. And this also implied, and he mentioned Wagner directly, this also implied that he's not willing to ask anyone, as he says, and I quote, to fight at the place of the Nigerian army. So there is this, this level of pride that he keeps flaunting. And in terms of communication, this is a particularly strong message, um, also compounded with this whole transparency. So speaking ahead of time, informing his public and his election base that, uh, that Niger needs help from Europeans and it does not intend to get any help from Wagner. So I think in terms of communication and transparency, he has done way better than, uh, than the, the current Malian junta. And this is something that, that, I think, that I think is very important. Now, this is particularly important also because Niger and the Nigerian government, Niamey, feels surrounded by countries that are deeply unstable at the moment, or that are stable in a way that is particularly authoritarian, like the, the case of Chad. From the point of view of Bazoum, um, is not just a matter of insecurity, but also diplomatically, he doesn't feel like he has strong relations with neighboring Burkina, Mali, Burkina Faso, Mali, and Chad. Um, from a security point of view, what this means, so the dégagement uh, Barkhane leaving Mali, what will this mean for Niger? This is to some, some extent positive, because if Barkhane is willing to relocate, and I mean, you know, it will have potentially a different name, it will be a transformed type of force, uh, you know, the French will, will, will name it differently, will, will um, frame uh, the intervention differently, uh, but Niger has been struggling with keeping insecurity at bay in the Tawa and Tilaberi. Tilaberi regions, which are the two regions that uh, border Mali, where most of the insecurity takes place. So now having uh, this aerial support from Barkhane is something that is particularly precious for the people that are fighting on the side of the Nigerian government in that area, which is uh, the Garde uh, Nationale. This is a positive development in terms of security, but at the same time, if we look at if we zoom out and we look at it from above, I mean, the safe heaven uh, for most of these terrorist groups has always been Mali, and it will continue continue to stay Mali because without French aerial support in Mali, the situation will get worse and worse. It will maybe improve in the short term in Niger, uh, but in the longer term, I think it will have problematic consequences. Ulf, coming back to you, Chancellor Scholz just uh, ended um, a visit to, to Niger after the German foreign minister visited Mali. Uh, simultaneously, also, the, the German government has decided to up its game uh, in the UN-led uh, peacekeeping mission in Mali, MINUSMA. How do you see this? On the other hand, the European Union is pulling out, out of Mali because of Russian mercenaries, and Germany has also been very vocal about that. Uh, but on the other hand, the government is adding troops in the same region, but just with another helmet. What's the reason behind this? Yeah, the main reason is that MINUSMA, I mean, the UN peacekeeping mission in northern Mali and central Mali, basically depends on Germany in a way that Germany provides logistical support from, uh, you know, food to electricity, and also, you know, aerial surveillance via drones and, and human intelligence. So if, if Germany pulled out and then... Uh, the French are gone, then other countries would probably leave as well. It would be the question whether the, the mission can be continued or not. So that, that that's the, the main reason. The other reason is, like, like Delina said, I mean, even if countries now try to boost their presence in Niger and, you know, work with the government there, the epicenter of, of insecurity is in, in central Mali. Countries, uh, the United Nations and are still staying here in European nations because uh, without Mali, you can't do anything. There's still also the hope that at some point, maybe the Russians being so much under pressure in Ukraine might reduce their military footprint here in Mali, and that would be then also a political opening for, for Western countries to re-engage with the transitional government in Bamako. 
both of you actually now mentioned that Mali is one of the regions where, where terrorism and, and the threats are, are coming from. So I would be interested now in your, both of your opinions. There's been a lot of feedback on UN missions that if you call it the UN peacekeeping mission, the only thing that they, where they can keep peace and, 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 and look for stability is the surrounding area of their own basis. Uh, I'm very interested in hearing your opinion on, on what is actually the, the goal, what should and how relevant is it and how, what kind of possibilities does a UN peacekeeping mission have in Mali uh, if, like I mentioned before, the U EU and other uh, actors are, are coming away? Maybe Delina will start with you. I would leave this to Ulf, actually, because, of course, he's uh, based in Mali and he knows much more than I do on MINUSMA. But I wanted to come in later on something related to Wagner. I think the main reasoning be behind the uh, you know continued ex existence of of, of MINUSPA in, in Mali is that without them things would be worse. I mean the security has deteriorated. The conflict has spread since MINUSPA deployed. You know almost ten years ago. The reasoning is that even without their presence things would have been worse. It, it, it's a very you know frustrating outcome that you know actually you would hope things would improve. Things have gone worse, but the, the, the Europeans or other Western nations think if we pulled out of Mali, things would even be much, much worse. Jihadists and others might you know, join forces to take over the north if Minusma leaves. So far, the government still controls the you know, main cities in, in northern and, and central Mali, like Mopti, Timbuktu, or Gao. They, they would struggle to do so without the UN. That's probably the main, main reason why we still be you know, staying there and there's still hope that things might uh, improve at some point. Alina, you wanted to comment on the Russian presence through mercenaries. Something resonated earlier um, when Ulf was talking about uh, Wagner and uh, and you asked um, a question on what is, what is there to gain, right? Why are they present and why do they seem so interested in this area? And of course, uh, Ulf uh, gave an answer that is very much correct. I mean, it is a matter of influence and it is a matter of economic benefits. But then there was a recent, um, I think Ulf, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it was something on Jeune Afrique recently, which did this short, I mean, it, it was a quick investigation, um, very recent, I mean, um, a few days ago, um, where they tried to understand what is it that Wagner is gaining at the moment? So are they being paid? Because they are, I mean, it's a, quite, it's a fairly costly force. It seems like the Malian government paid them for the first tranche of their presence in Mali, but they haven't paid them since. And at the same time, in terms of concessions, so mining, for example, like you rightfully mentioned, in terms of mining concessions, nothing is moving. So it seems like the economic benefits that they want to get from being present in the Sahel, they are not reaping yet they are not uh, able to exploit yet. And at the same time, it, it feels like the influence reason seems much stronger at the moment. So just being present and having caused what they have caused. So this huge stir, you know, in Brussels, in Paris, in Berlin, uh, this has, of course, had consequences within European countries as well as in the Sahel. Thanks, Darina. I, I'd like to also go back to back to you, Ulf. Um, we see now that uh, the war in Ukraine has been over three months now, uh, much longer than predicted by many, uh, many experts. Um, what does the prolongation of this war, which probably will not end very soon, what does it mean for the Sahel region? Yeah, generally, there's a high risk of food prices, uh, inflation, you know, going up. Here in Mali, I mean, I mean, prices have been really increasing because the, the country has been under sanctions by the West African community, ECOWAS, you know, who wanted to, to, to punish Mali for having failed to organize uh, elections, we, which had been due in last February. So, I mean, prices have been anyway going up and, and I expect now they, they will even further increase uh, also in the, in the face of the fact that the last harvest in Mali, and, uh, you know, Delina, correct me, and uh, probably in Niger and other countries as well, has been, has been you know, very poor because of uh, lack of rain. And, uh, you know, th these countries, they really depend on, on food imports, which get more and more expensive. And you could see already, you know, fuel prices uh, going up in, in Mali that that has always a, like a, you know, a ripple effect, you know, all sorts of things. People can't move around anymore. Agricultural products get more expensive. So it's a real, uh, you know, downward spiral. And that's, I'm really concerned about that, uh, that the economic situation might really implode here in, in, in Mali at some point. 
Yeah, that is a very sober reading. Uh, something that we're hearing uh, here in Yame uh, is that, uh, of course, uh, Bazoum intervened on this as well. Um, and something that, that he said was, and this was done to reassure the public, but also to some extent, it is true, um, that uh, the Nigerian population doesn't consume as many goods that come from Ukraine. And so the effects that this will have on the market will not be as heavy as people were suspecting at the beginning. I suspect, I mean, I, I believe this is very much done to reassure. But at the same time, something, something that he said, and I think this is particularly striking because it is slightly, I have no other way to define this but passive aggressive. He said that Europe is giving a lot to Ukraine and basically, I mean, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, uh, peanuts to the Sahel. So he said, you know, I, I know you're all intervening and I know you're all concerned about Ukraine and that is, you know, that is correct. But at the same time, look at us. We also need help. And we need help in terms of, you know, basic services, development, governance, security. So, so once again, he reminded the European publics that the Sahel is in a situation of crisis. Chancellor Scholz was uh, visiting uh, Niger and there was a communique where uh, the Nigerian president mentioned the areas where he would like to cooperate with Germany. These were very broad, uh, ranging from vocational education to agriculture, uh, social aspects uh, of the government. And he mentioned security as one of the last topics, as a new topic where um, cooperation could be deepened. Uh, as Delina just mentioned earlier, there's a wide range of areas where Europe should cooperate uh, with Sahel because there's a, a huge need. How do you see Ulf security prism now dominating the, um, the role also in the backdrop of the Ukraine war? Uh, what does this mean for the general cooperation with Sahel? I mean, there's, there's a common sense that you need security to even allow development programs to go ahead. That's why there has been this, this outreach to, to, you know, to governments in the region to improve their security forces, uh, like in Mali, as I, I guess in, in Niger. Niger is now the idea that part of the trainers of the European training mission will relocate there. There are already 200 German special forces are building an academy and, you know, since uh, Niger is one of the last, uh, you know, democratically elected uh, government with, with somewhat functioning institutions in the region, their the focus is there to, to do even more. I mean, this is all right. I think the risk is a bit that you overload uh, Niger. There's already, I think the Americans have a drone basis and other Western countries, they're also, you know, uh, you know, boosting their training efforts by Barkhane or however you would call it, the French anti-terror operation has its headquarters now in Niamey. So Lina uh, will know better, but I imagine there's also a bit of a lingering anti-French sentiment. If you put in too many Western, you know, troops into, you know, a country that's already, you know, fragile and, and suffering from so many challenges, I think there's also a bit of a, you know, domestic political risk that this might, might backfire at point. But, you know, the, the general approach to, to boost uh, security forces in, in Niger is, 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 is certainly the right one. This actually brings me to my to my last uh, question. We mentioned the French, we mentioned the Americans, we mentioned the European Union pullout shifting. We have Russian mercenaries, all in very fragile states uh, in the region. So, very broadly, uh, what should the European Union or should it then even be active uh, as a security guarantor in the region? What should it do? Uh, I would uh, would be very interested to hear both of your views. But Delina, maybe you want to start. I just wanted, I mean, this is, a, of course, is a very good question and is something that, uh, that as Europeans, we, we should all be thinking long and hard about. I think there is, there is one thing, as, as Ulf was, was talking about Niger and this influx and saturation of forces, uh, which is really uh, dealing with a space that is a security space that is quite needy, but at the same time clogged and, and slowed down by a series of of issues that, I mean, we will talk about uh, on another occasion. And um, I think something that Europe should bear in mind whenever intervening in this region, and specifically in Niger now, where a lot of the European and, uh, you know, EU and European bilateral efforts will focus, I think is also, I mean, Europe is losing negotiating power because uh, the Nigerian government at this moment has so many, you know, basically partners offering to help that they can pick and choose also because Europe has no other strong partner in the region 
you have Chad, you have Burkina Faso, you have Mali, it's very difficult to even engage a diplomatic dialogue. So it's going to be quite easy, I find, for Bazoum to ask for what he needs. And again, I say Bazoum, but of course, I mean uh, the, the leadership around him and uh, the various ministries, etc. So it's going to be it's, it's going to be quite easy. And, uh, you know, they, they will have the upper hand in, in a negotiation procedure. So I think before we make recommendations to Europe, I think Europe should be very much aware of this. Europe, I mean, Brussels, Paris, Berlin, Rome, and you know the, the, the main the main partners engaged in the Sahel. Now, one of the things I would like to mention in terms of recommendations is is the fact that while being in Brussels uh, for for a number of years and uh, working on the Sahel for for some of those years, um, the perception on the Sahel was always that the region was a problem. The region was perceived mostly as something to be to be dealt with, something that needed to be tackled. And I do understand that, that there are development humanitarian security problems, but Europe does not see this region as an opportunity. And it is a region where most of the population is young, where most of the population is, you know, in, in search of employment, uh, where, where there is a certain degree of human energy that, that doesn't seem to be thought of in those terms. We keep talking about demographic boom in Europe. We keep talking about laboratory of European, uh, pan-European security cooperation, but we never see this region as something rich, something like a, a region rich in people. Wolf, I would uh, give over to you. Any recommendations? We should see the region as an opportunity, not as a threat that Ina mentioned. What should Europe do? There's no alternative to our continued engagement there. Uh be it on the, on the military front in terms of training or, you know, you know probably even trying to expand uh, development projects. Like uh, Delina said, I mean, the region is very young. People want to work and obviously in Europe, you know, you know many don't want them to, uh, to migrate to Europe and, you know, seek illegal migration via, via Libya, which is very dangerous. So it's, it's, it's for us to, to, to try to help, you know, the region to unlock its potential and uh, you know so so people find employment and you know nobody wants to 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 leave their country challenges are definitely there i'm i'm not sure what else we can do more really now i mean but but like delina also said we in europe tend to a bit you know overestimate our influence i mean there there's so many players now turkey is really expanding they they built a brand new terminal airport in in, in niger's capital china is here now the russians are here so that, that that's all the more reason for us to to stay engaged despite all the challenges and frustration with uh, you know uh, with, with the, the russians you know making progress here and you know ex expanding their presence we should definitely stay engaged and advance uh, you know development projects as well as our you know military you know, cooperation wherever it's possible and feasible can i just jump in here uh, very quickly on the on the military side of things because in in terms of recommendations again you know ways forward um I think there is an approach that, and, and again, you know, I'm going to caricature a bit because um, what to simplify things, uh, there is an approach to stabilization that is very much perceived as German, and it is discussed as German within uh, Niger, which is an approach that takes into account everything and that does everything at the same time. I'll explain myself. Uh, the way Barkhan worked in Mali, and one of the reasons why I believe Barkhan failed in Mali, was that it does think of security development and humanitarian aid in separate moments. So it is a stabilization approach that wishes to empty an area of potential terrorist threats and then intervene with humanitarian and development aid. This is something that Germany, that Berlin, has understood uh, quite well, doesn't work. You do not void an area, you do not neutralize terrorists, and then the area is, and, and again, I mean, I, I, I quote uh, the way the French talk about this, the area is clean and then you can intervene. The way stabilization should work is by always having a certain degree of lack of naivete, where you know that you cannot entirely clean an area, once again, um, but it's something that should be done in consultation with local leaders, uh, with religious leaders. It should, and, and it should be on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on the village, depending on what is happening in that area at that moment. So context analysis 
is fundamental, but then of course this comes with its own challenges because in order to do context analysis, you need to be present. And for researchers, and, I, and I'm not just talking about European ones, but even Sahelian ones, to get into some of these villages is, is practically impossible. So to get access and be able to tell on a case-by-case -case basis how to do stabilization programs is particularly difficult. So I understand the challenges, but I think Europe should be ambitious. Europe should be more uh, ambitious. Um, that is a that is a good sentence to 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 draw to conclusions here. Um, I also took upon that uh, it should be a whole society or a whole country, whole society approach instead of having sectoral engage and then go step by step. Uh, that is something we will continue discussing. Uh, I would like to uh, thank you both, uh, Ulf Lessing, for joining us from Bamako as well as Derina Gojo um, from uh, Niame, Niger. Dear listeners, also thank you for tuning in to Breaching Voices podcast series. Uh, you can listen to the full episodes of Breaching Voices on SoundCloud, Spotify and YouTube. Please also follow and tag us on LinkedIn, Facebook and Twitter. Thank you much. Bye bye.